What if our cities didn't have to look like this? What if instead of being crammed into giant vertical glass boxes, we had terraces with gardens, air, open space, and a real connection to nature? What if our skyscrapers saw diagonally instead? And what if they weren't skyscrapers at all, but stacked villages with flying streets in between them and every amenity you could dream of just a short distance away? This is Habitat 67, and it may be one of the most important building ideas of the 20th century. It reimagined urban living and inspired a generation of architects. But in many respects, it's considered a failed dream that remains largely unfinished. Only a small portion of the original master plan was ever built. That is, until now. Some 56 years later, Habitat 67 is finally being completed. Just not in the way that anyone thought. Habitat 67 is a big deal. Habitat 67. Habitat 67. It looks bizarre. It's a very desirable place to live in. Magnificent. It's incredible. Young Montreal designer, Moshe Safdie. Moshe Safdie. Moshe Safdie. Pioneered a new housing typology. Reinventing the apartment building. But this monumental piece of architecture had an unlikely start in life. It began as the thesis of a sixth-year architecture student, then took shape at the 1967 Montreal World's Fair. An audacious and very young Moshi Safdi submitted his designs to the World's Fair when he was just 23 and apprenticing under American architect Louis Kahn. It began with a journey I made through North America to study housing in a scholarship I had at McGill. And I came to the conclusion that the suburban Levittowns were not, uh, they're not feasible in the long term. They just consume too much land, too much energy, too much transportation. We have to bring people back to the city. But people prefer houses. That's why they're in the suburbs. Therefore, if we could reinvent the apartment building so that it gives you the quality of life of a house, garden, privacy, access through an open street, people will be more willing to live in cities. How will this fair differ from other world's fairs? Oh, it's bigger. Now, it's typical for World's Fair Expos to build entirely new structures to host the event. The Unisphere, being built by United States Steel. Other expos before them built tower monuments and gimmick structures that would be taken down soon after. But Canada wanted to construct something substantial, something that would make us rethink the way we lived. They found it in Habitat 67. It would be a pilot program for a whole new type of housing, one that wouldn't contribute to sprawl or just be another soulless tower. But to really understand why this was so groundbreaking, we have to put ourselves in the 1960s. Mag, darling, you're being a boy. You miss? I feel pretty. Today, you and I live in a period of tremendous growth. The growth of these regions presents one of the biggest challenges facing our nation. The problem of urban sprawl. Two very important things were happening in urban planning at this time. The first was zoning. We began dividing our cities up, separating them into their functions. Residential in one part of the city, offices and employment in another part of the city, industry in another part of the city, all separated because the concept was you shouldn't mix different land uses in one place. The problem is, people's lives aren't divided as cleanly as that. Part of the reason why zoning came to popularity was because of the car. Suddenly it was possible to separate out these places by vast distances. But then we're designing our cities for cars and not for people. Habitat 67 does away with this idea. Instead, it puts everything in the same place. It was one of the first truly mixed-use developments, words we now see to describe almost every major new construction project. A mixed-use development is one which takes all the ingredients of urban life and accommodates them within a structure. So in its simplest form, it's a shopping center with towers of residential and offices and other facilities. But in its most sublime form, 
its residences with all the things that community needs like schools and shops around them, plus places for work, offices, workshops, etc., integrated into a singular development. This folded into utopian ideas for architecture that started to emerge in this time following the post-war period. Everything was being rethought and anything could be possible. So Canada took a chance on a 23-year-old freshly graduated architect and his bold idea. At the core of Safdie's vision was prefabrication, apartments made in factories, assembled module by module and on site. As he developed Habitat 67, he came up with the concept of a hillside. Safdie's original thesis had the modules stacked 20 to 30 stories high in a frame-like tower structure. But he realised that if he leaned them back as if they were on a hillside, they could all have gardens and other areas open to the sky. The hillsides would hover over sheltered public spaces on the ground below and would be laced with streets every four floors for access. And for everyone a garden, every house with its own roof terrace open to the sky. Not a balcony, a terrace open to the sky. And so that seemed to be the ultimate kind of realization of the quality of life in the city at high density that we could have conceived. At the time, it was $45 million. It represented a community of 1,200 families with all the mixed use components. In today's dollars, it's probably $450 million. But Safdie and his team were unable to secure the $45 million in funding. Instead, the government gave them a budget of just 15 million. And when they said 15 million dollars, my first reaction was go to hell. It's everything or nothing. And then I started rationalizing. And so it took 24 hours to have me go through full cycle of saying, I can't miss that opportunity. It won't be the ideal, which led to the habitat that we built, which is not the membranes, it's kind of more of a village, an urban village. Instead of a community for 1,200 families rising 30 storeys into the air, Safdie's habitat was scaled back to just 158 residences across three pyramids, less than half the original height. It didn't make it different. It didn't reduce the quality of life within your apartment or you still had your gardens, you still had your open streets, but by scaling it down, it became more of a building than a community. It's now 1963 and we're still decades away from computer-assisted technology. 3D printers are more than half a century off and this immensely complicated design had to be developed entirely by hand through sketches and models. So many, many models. The work was labour-intensive and the days were long. At its peak, Safdie was spending up to 14 hours in his studio at a time. Then, something amazing happened. Hey, kids, look! Lego is here! The Habitat design team bought nearly every Lego set in Montreal when the little plastic bricks first arrived in North America. Lego was a, a block, but it was modular, and it had the capacity to, to connect. But it had the discipline, there was a system to it. You could connect it through the clicking, so it could be stacked or 90 degrees or in parallel shifted by increments. And it was working with that system that I designed Habitat with Legos. Turning these blocks into reality required an engineer with immense skill. To find one, Safdie ended up poaching an engineer from his former boss, architect Louis Kahn. It promised to be one of the most challenging construction projects of the decade, and the pyramid structures, with gaping holes underneath them, worried many traditionalists. In fact, both McGill University and the University of Toronto produced a report stating that if Habitat was built as designed, it would collapse. And if it didn't collapse on its own, then it would probably be brought down by an earthquake. Safdie and his engineer had to convince the city of Montreal that they knew what they were doing. When the first module was lifted into place, Safdie's wife christened it with a champagne bottle, as though it were a maiden voyage of a grand ship. 
Before the buildings were even finished, they started stoking controversy. In 1965, critics called for a royal commission to investigate why something so foolish was being constructed. In 1966, a new minister wanted their funding stripped and the units dumped into the St. Lawrence River, but the project was already too far along. There were labour shortages too, and the construction team had to rush to get everything ready for Expo 67. In the end, one third of the interiors were left unfinished to be completed at a later date. Slowly but surely, each module was cast in a factory operated on site, then lifted into place by crane. Safdie was proving to the world that prefabricated housing could work. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. The things that turn up in the street these days. Sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand. The day of the expo arrived. More than 50 million people descended on the Canadian city throughout the duration of the World's Fair, a record that's not been beaten. Safdie moved into one of the apartments with his wife and two children and lived there throughout the duration of the event. By all accounts, Habitat 67 was a triumph. Suddenly, Safdie became what we would now call a star architect. Offers from all over the world came in to visit and lecture. He'd set the architecture scene on fire. Well, in that respect, it's, uh, it's like uh, living happily ever after because Habitat is a vital, successful and very desirable community. And the fact that people stayed there for decades, the fact that in many cases the second generation and even third generation live there, that it has the longest occupancy of any building in Canada, that shows you people love it, they, they want to be there. During the 1970s, the wait list to rent an apartment in Habitat 67 was more than five years long. But as the decades passed, its legacy, while inspiring awe, was that of an unfulfilled dream. The architectural revolution it promised never came. Hey, mon mère. It's pink. It's supposed I, to be pink. I did try. I am you. And you are me. <laughs> It's these buildings that embody the two greatest words of the human imagination. Two words that, when uttered correctly, have shifted the course of civilizations, created movements, and opened minds. What if? A very young and emboldened Safdie dared to stand against the establishment and ask just that. These buildings ask it still to this day. And today's architects and designers are doing the same. What if Habitat 67 had been completed to its original design? Would this dream of housing be available to everyone? Could it still be? Neoscape approached Safety Architects about modelling Habitat 67 digitally to preserve and share the design with the world. It was Safety Architects that then proposed completing Habitat 67 virtually, but all of it this time. Using Epic Games' Unreal Engine, technology that Safety could only have imagined back in the 60s, this could now actually be done. I kept going back to that, kept going back to those ideas that Habitat was built on. I also knew that Habitat was never built like it was designed to be built. When Epic came to us with the challenge of bringing Habitat 67 to life, we were, we were super excited. It was a, a project that is uh, important in the uh, architectural world. The team worked with Safdi to complete the original master plan. This included the enormous 30-story A-framed towers that leaned back from the riverbank. Working with Safdi on this project in particular was interesting because it, it was working on a design that was thought of, concepted 50 plus years ago. That took him aback a little bit. Uh, he, he sat in his chair, leaned back, held his head and, and, and said, yes, let's do it. So when Neoscape and Epic came to us and said, what about the original Habitat? Actually, I was very excited because I've never actually experienced three-dimensionally what it's like. And so it's always been a question in my mind, what would it be like if we really had those $45 million? How would it have been as a community? Are there hidden issues there that we didn't realize? But yeah, that's, this is it, this is the final product.
This amazing. We showed him for the first time the whole project. His reaction was uh, something that you would have to blip, <laughs> I guess. He was uh, very much uh, happy with it. He said, imagine if I had this in 1964, I would have convinced them and we would have built it. It was an immediate reaction, I would love to live there. And that's the ultimate test. I mean, I would love to live there. And yet, at the same time, I realized, boy, it was that ahead of its time. It's ahead of its time today. And I hope that actually making this accessible to the public at large as an image, as an idea, you could live like that, would now help advance people's desire to have this realized. This model has been painstakingly created by those who are passionate about Safdie's vision, just like his original physical models in the 60s. That's my hope. My hope is that people can see it, learn from it, and play with it. What if are tantalizing words? They can shift mountains, hillsides. Safdie's ideas have returned to the architectural zeitgeist. A new generation is discovering them, and instead of letting them rest on the banks of the St. Lawrence River, they want to do something with them. This video was made possible by Epic Games. You can explore the hillside model for yourself at the link below. That is really, really worth doing. In addition, you'll also be able to continue this story in part two and find out how this generation of architects worked with Safdie to fully realize his vision. We dive deeper on this and the other topics on our channel over on the World's Best Construction Podcast, available right now wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you subscribe to the B1M.